do we know? Or in another way, because most of us are believers in this room, we would say, I believe this. But why or how is Jesus the only way? Some, somebody might just say, is Jesus the only way? Is Jesus the only way to salvation? There's a lot of other ways out there. How could I say Jesus is the only way? And first, I want to be real with you and let you know I'm not covering all the apologetics questions of all time, or else we would be here all week. Um, I'm making two presumptions, two assumptions as a believer and after a lot of research that, so, that, so that we can start somewhere today. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm not going to go back to like the beginning, like, is God real? Does he exist? I don't know. So that's number one. The first assumption that I'm going to start with today is that God is real. The second assumption I'm going to start with, thanks to Pastor Ben, is that the Bible is true, true and trustworthy. So I want to give you some resources at the end of this um, message because I also think that you, if you are struggling with either of those assumptions, that's okay. Um, And there are a lot of great resources out there. And so if you just have your phone at the very end, there's going to be some resources that actually I found really helpful for this message. Um, And they're going to flash up at the end and you can just take a picture of them and order them on Amazon today. So but that's where we're going to start, though. God is real. The Bible is true. So let's get to our question. Is Jesus the only way to God or to salvation? Or is he just a way to God and to salvation? Um, because as Christians, that's what we believe. But why do we believe that? And if we do believe that he's the only way, isn't that exclusive? And isn't exclusivity unloving? You know, like, what it, what, you know what exclusive means, right? Like, you know, you and your boyfriend, you're exclusive. That's what it means. Like, there's no one else in the relationship, right? So inclusive would be including everyone. You know, we want to be like that. That's being kind. So is Jesus being the only way, is that unkind if it's exclusive? Are there lots of ways to God, and are we all just going to end up at the same place at the end of the day in heaven with God? So some people might ask it this way. Aren't we just all going up the same mountain? You know, like, I'm not much of a hiker. Like, you don't really know me, but I don't know if you can tell. Like, I just don't hike a lot. Um, I like a day hike. Um, I don't want to camp after that. But I love a day hike. But even I know that there are many trails sometimes that lead to the same destination. Um, You might be a really experienced hiker, and so you have all this gear, and you're like, I'm going to go the straightest path to the top of the mountain or to this waterfall or whatever you're doing. And it's only three miles. But you got to get all your gear on and you got to climb straight up at one point. And that's where we would diverge. I will be going on the eight mile around the scenic route that's mostly flat. And then we will both get to the waterfall, right? We'll take some pictures. Um, that happens. I mean, even in Georgia, there are trails like that. You can, you can kind of pick your adventure, you know, choose your own way. Um, and so... I mean, is that how it is for religion? Did we, somebody just start on one side of the mountain um, and then somebody just start on the other side of the mountain and maybe somebody got dropped in by a helicopter, but we're all going up the same mountain? The world would say, of course, that sounds wonderful. That sounds so friendly. Um, it, it really lends itself to the culture that we live in, um, this postmodern, relativistic, pluralistic culture. All those big words just mean that the, the culture we live in uh, is, it, that considers truth a relative thing. So truth is just, all claims of truth might be true, right? I could say, well, my truth is my truth. We say things like that in our culture all the time. You know, like, oh, well, yeah, you speak your truth, girl. I'll speak my truth. And while it is true, I mean, some of that, their their unique experiences are true. Like for me, my truth might be that ice cream is the best. And I'm like, that's my truth. (laughs) Like best dessert ever. Don't even try. And you might be like, well, for me, my truth is that cookies are the best. And like those things can coexist. That's not what I'm talking about though, right? We, because we as a culture have started to define ultimate reality as things that our, our experiences shape what is real. We say, my experience, and if it doesn't apply to me, then it's not true. But we all know, and I think we can all agree deep down in our heart, maybe not even that deep, that doesn't make sense. I don't get to decide what reality is. I don't get to make up good and evil. 
I don't get to make up when the sun decides to come up and when the sun decides to set. I don't get to decide when I live or when I die. There's a reality of life that I don't get to decide. And I don't get to define God. But we've let this idea of relativism and applying our own experience to make something true or not to spiritual truth as well. Even Jesus. We'll hear things like, well, Jesus, that's great for you, but I'm good. I'm good. I mean, aren't they all the same? You know, Jesus, Mohammed, Gandhi, Nirvana, self-help, throwing some crystals, good vibes. Like, it's, it's all the same. We could just have a little bit of each, like a little buffet. You know, and it's funny. My kids, Anna Jean, Shiloh, Johnny, they're over there. And all summer, so they have separate rooms. Anna Jean and Shiloh share. Johnny has his own room. And they, all summer, though, they've taken their mattresses off their beds and put them in Anna Jean and Shiloh's room. And then they put, covered it with pillows and blankets and um, stuffed animals and then, you know, made the dream mattress. It's all the, these pieces put together to make one mattress. And I love that. But, y'all, that doesn't work for spiritual things. We can't put one thing here and one thing here and one thing here and then cover it with a blanket and say, look, it's one thing. It's the same thing. It's going to become one thing. It's never going to become one thing. And I want us to see, again, how logically the idea that all roads lead to the same place does not hold up. And so in his book, Case for Christ, which I highly recommend, Lee Strobel, um, he's an atheist turned, turned Christian, um, journalist, uh, interviewed a panel of religious leaders from the three major world religions. And each one agreed on one thing. They disagreed about who Jesus was. Well, they maybe they agreed on two things. They also agreed that the religion they represented had claims of exclusive truth. Right? So each one had a different definition of Jesus. Teacher, prophet, blasphemer, Lord, human. There's no common goal. Just the three. Just three major ones. No common pinnacle, no destination that everyone agreed on. And again, other religions, that's not even including the many, many, many other religions who have maybe multiple gods. Some don't have a god at all. And some just say you can be like God, God-likeness, or works-based faith, reincarnation, or whatever it is. So no one's climbing the same mountain. They're all different mountains. They're not saying the same thing in different terms. They're all exclusive in nature. And so even um, logically, even the person that says, yeah, but I believe that all ways are the same. Even that claim is exclusive. Tim Keller says this, it's no more narrow to claim that one religion is right than to claim that one way to think about religion, i.e. that they are all the same, is right. We are all exclusive in our beliefs about religion, but in different ways. So all religions make exclusive claims. Only Christianity claims that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So exclusivity is not the hallmark of Christianity. Exclusivity, that every religion has that. Jesus is the hallmark of Christianity. And so we have to decide who Jesus is. Outside of Christianity, like we just mentioned, some say he's a prophet. Even in some religions, he's a prophet. Others say he's a good moral teacher. C.S. Lewis makes this uh, argument against this, a famous argument in mere Christianity. And he says, it's kind of a long quote, but stick with me. <laughs> he's a good writer. Just, just, it's good. Just let it sink in. I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus. Well, I'm ready to accept Jesus is a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that, left that open to us. He did not intend to. So we weren't the only ones to be asking this question, who was Jesus, like people in history, but even as far back into the scripture, into Jesus' time, they were all trying to figure out who Jesus 
is, right? Again, some of the, there was an argument going on. Some of the Jewish people that were following Jesus said, this man is surely a prophet. Like he's doing things that look like they're from God. Surely he's a prophet. And then others said, no, he has demons in him. Like he's just from the, from, from the devil, from hell. And then still some believed. And they said, wow, you are the son of God. So I want us to go back to our first two assumptions. God is real, number one. And if the Bible is true, then we have a third and we have to take it very seriously. And number three, Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus said, is who he says he is. And so in this book, if we believe this is true, we look back and we see what did Jesus say about himself over and over and over again. I mean, we hear him say, he said, I'm the light of the world. He said, I'm the gate. I'm the bread of life, the living water. I came to bring life to the full. I am eternal life. Knowing God and knowing me, that's eternal life. But for our question today, two claims stand out, and I want us to see them in Scripture. The first is this. Jesus said he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So the the people of his time, they're waiting. They've been waiting for a long time for a Messiah. They knew from the Old Testament a, a little bit about what the Messiah would look like, who he would be. It wasn't this new concept. Um, and so when he, Jesus is walking around, that's why it, what caused some tension. All the people that are trying to figure out who he is. Y'all, Jesus was not having an identity crisis, though. He was the only one. He knew who he was. And this is what he says. So in John 4, this is a really famous story. Um, if you haven't heard it, go read the whole thing. But it is, it's an incredible story of Jesus with the woman at the well. She's in the well in the middle of the day. And we find out why. It's because she's probably trying to, you know, be there alone. But he, he says, well, why, you know, why don't you go get your husband and come back and I'll give you this living water I've been telling you about. And Jesus asks a great question. And she's like, I don't have a husband. He says, I, I know. In fact, you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. She was like, whoa. So I don't know if she's diverting at this point. This is where we pick up. You know when someone asks you a hard question, you're like, I'm going to change the subject. Or if she really feels like, wow, this man knows a lot. He just told me my life. And so this is what she says, sir, verse 19, I can see that you are a prophet. (laughs) Duh. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. She's like, I have a question for you. Do you have a friend like that? That they're like, oh, you're a Christian. Let me ask about Adam and Eve. And you're like, oh, my gosh. Literally, that's happened to me. I was like, I don't know. So I can see that you're a prophet. I have a question. I've been thinking about this. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. They're even asking about mountains. But you Jews claim that this place is where we must worship, over here in Jerusalem, on this mountain. And and he says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and is here now, or has now come. Say, has now come. Has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. In what? Truth. Right. So, some worship on this mountain, others on this mountain. But like, what do, where do we worship? And Jesus, I don't even know, he doesn't answer the question directly, but this is what he says. The time is coming and has now come. Why does he say that? Because Jesus is talking about himself. The day is here because I'm standing here. And then the woman, she doesn't get it. Well, probably I wouldn't get it. She says, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So Jesus is the Messiah. A few chapters later, this brawl breaks out again, and there's a lot of religious leaders, and they're grilling Jesus, and they're like, who are you? Just tell us who you are. And, and he's like, I've already told you who I am. And you know what? If Abraham was here, he'd be excited about this. Abraham would say, he would tell you how he feels about this. He's been waiting for this day. And they said, Jesus, you're not even 50. How does Abraham know you? How do you, like, you're not older than Abraham. And this is what he says. I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. 
I am. He uses the name in the Greek text for I am the I am. Like the Exodus, burning bush, Moses, I am. And they picked up stones off the ground to stone him because he was blasphemy. He was saying, I am equal with God because I am God. I'm the son of God in human form. I am the Messiah. So if this is true, claim number one, I am the Messiah, then this is also true. Jesus' second claim, I am the only way to salvation. So this confusion of who Jesus was, it wasn't just reserved for these outcast sinners at wells in the middle of the day. It was his own disciples, also sinners like you and me, (laughs) who had been with him, hanging out with him, doing ministry with him, watching him heal and cast out demons and feed 5,000 people and walk on water and tell the waves to be quiet. They were his friends and they were not sure who Jesus was. They asked essentially the same question. So flip to John 14. We'll start at the beginning. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why are they troubled? This is in the middle of a farewell discourse. So Jesus knows his time has come. And he, they've had the last supper. He's washed their feet. They're having this time. He keeps saying things like, I have to go somewhere where you can't go. And they're like, wait, what? what? Why? No, like... Where are you going? They are troubled. They are deeply troubled. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Don't let your hearts be troubled. I love that. He speaks into our anxieties and our confusion. And then he says, believe, you believe in God. Believe also in me. There he is again saying, we're the, we are one. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I have, I'm going back there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me to be where I am. Then he says this in verse 4, you know the way to where I'm going. Say to your neighbor, you know the way. But y'all, Thomas didn't know the way. Verse 5, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Y'all, Thomas gets a bad rap sometimes. Doubting Thomas, like that's his nickname for all eternity. How about honest Thomas? I didn't hear any of those other disciples pipe up. Wait, I know where you're going. No, he's honest. He voices what the group is thinking, and I love that. Notice that Jesus didn't belittle his question. Questions are not bad. They are good, especially when you look at who he is asking. Jesus. How can we know the way? Ask the right person, get the right answer. Sometimes in our culture, we live in this, um, you know, it's a badge of honor to just ask questions all the time to, to each other. When really, let's ask Jesus. Let's take him up on his invitation. Ask, seek, knock. I will open the door. I will answer your questions. And then in verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. By the way, Jesus is the only one who gets to say my truth and it's real, okay? He can say it, it's my truth. I am the truth. In the original language, it's like they're describing the way. So truth and life. The way is truth and the way is life. This way leads to truth and this way leads to life. But the way is not a road. And the way is not a religion. And the way is not an experience. The way is a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the way. And this way is going somewhere. Thomas said, we don't know where we're going, so how can we know the way? First off, we don't need to know where Jesus is going. A, if we're with him, we don't need to know the way. We have the way. But he's gracious to let us in. And the disciples didn't even fully know what he was talking about, but we can look back and see now what he was saying. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you skip down to verse 12, he says, very, uh, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. But why? Because I am going to the Father. Jesus is going to the Father. How was he going to the Father? By way of the cross. Jesus is the way because Jesus did the work. 
Jesus is the way to salvation because he did the work required for salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God the Father. We had sin. We could not get to the Father. Jesus had no sin. He and the Father were one. He, he was the only one who could lay his life down so that we could get back to the Father. Romans 3, 22 through 24, it says this righteousness, this righteousness that we have now, it's given in faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by means of or by way of Christ Jesus. He didn't just come here to be a good teacher or a nice prophet. He came to be the way back to God. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Philippians 2 says, being in very nature God, he took on the very quality of a servant, very nature of a servant, made in a human likeness. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He's the way because he did the work. And so I love how even Pastor Louis said that last night. It's like, the one who was there at creation, who by all things was made and for all things were made. Each religion over here going up their own mountain and Jesus made the mountains and yet he came down to us to be the way so that he could be raised to life and we could be with God forever because of him. And so talk about exclusive, right? Who else could walk that road? Only one could do it. Jesus is the only one. And so his exclusivity is what makes him inclusive. He's the only way so that everyone can have a way. He's the most inclusive exclusivity there ever was. You know, John 3, 16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son who could save us so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting Life. And for some of us, we th hear exclusive, and we may think, what about our family and friends who haven't heard of Jesus, who, ha who don't know Jesus? The gospel is for everyone to hear, and it's true, not everyone has heard. Who needs to know about the gospel in your life? Who's the fill in the blank in your life that you think of in, in your mind? If we believe Jesus is the way for us, for me, it's not just my truth. I want it to be our truth. Because it is the truth. I want it to be your truth. And so in my mind, I have that person in my mind. Do you have that person in your mind? Your mom, your best friend, your coach, your teacher, your cousin. We can pray that God would stir us up for, with purpose in our hearts for that person. Pray for them and also pray for opportunities to share with them. And I just, I, I want you to pray for that in your own heart as we begin this kind of end moment. But like, that's where this intersects with our lives in a really practical way. Because the gospel is meant to be shared. It's meant to be taken to the ends of the earth. It's just very naturally transferable from person to person. And so let the Holy Spirit stir up in your heart affection for people who don't know him. It's not just for us. If it is the truth, it's the truth. For everybody. And so for some of us, though, we think of exclusive, right? And we say, oh, exclusivity, that sounds so restrictive. But exclusivity can be really freeing. When I said yes to Brett 13 years ago, when he said yes to me 13 years ago, we said no to everyone else. We said no to all the other options. Um, and all the other options, there were, they were still there, but they became non-options. Because there's a freedom and commitment. There's a great peace in knowing that I choose one and the one chooses me. And will there be trouble? Of course. Will there be hardship? Of course. Will there be questions? Of course. Will there be joy and ups and downs? Yes. But we do it together and we don't have a backdoor escape plan. We don't have a back little hatch where you can just sneak out back. It's till death do us part. And marriage is just a picture. It's this imperfect picture. But with Jesus... We commit to him and it's perfect. He's perfect. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. 
And so we say yes to him, and when we do, we say no to all others. Namely, the world, its allures, all the other options, any other ways claiming to be Jesus or like Jesus. And for some of you, Jesus has just been an option. You've, no, you, you've, you've, fo- you've followed Jesus. You've, I've had a moment with Jesus. But he's just become this option. There's Jesus and something else. Jesus and social media. Jesus and my relationship. Jesus and this other kind of religious experience. Jesus and an addiction. Whatever it is, it's caused you to go a different way. But today, I really feel like there's people in here where the Holy Spirit's stirring that up inside you and saying, I need to come back to the way today. I want to return to Jesus and only Jesus today. And some of you have never made that choice. You've never seen your need for saving. Or maybe you've been trying to do life on your own and go your own way, going up the mountain by yourself. Maybe you're running away as fast as you can from that mountain. But you're tired. I would tell him that. Jesus said to his disciples, believe in God, believe also in me. And he will give you the Holy Spirit. He said, I will give you peace. Don't be troubled. There's a great peace that we cannot give ourselves that comes from knowing Jesus. Peace and then life and purpose sealed with the Holy Spirit both now and forever. He's the only way.